Boom! What's up, Internet? Josh Miles here, and today we've got something special for you. This is a full recording of a behind-the-scenes from a live taping of my design podcast called Obsessed with Design. Special thank you to Josh Polk and IUPUI and the Computer Graphics Technology Department for having us out. Um, For those of you who are not already subscribed to Obsessed with Design, head over to ObsessedShow.com and you can definitely find all the links to the show, whether it's iTunes or Stitcher or iHeartRadio or Spotify. All of them are there. No matter how you listen to podcasts, you'll be sure to find the link there. Now, for those of you who have been listening to the show for a while, you'll know it starts a little something like this. Welcome to Obsessed with Design a show about what makes designers tick. I'm your host, Josh Miles. For those of you who are listening on audio today, before we get into today's episode, make sure and check out the video version of today's episode over at obsessedshow.com, or you can also find it at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. While you're on YouTube, make sure and check out my 59 Second Friday series on YouTube. I'm currently building out new episodes all about personal brand. So if that sounds like something you're into, you can subscribe at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. I really appreciate every single subscriber, both on the podcast and uh, on the YouTube series. So if you haven't already, make sure and hit subscribe on both of those channels. Special thanks today to Josh Polk and the Computer Graphics Technology Department for having us out. Today on Obsessed with Design, I'm chatting with three special guests, all from the Indianapolis creative community, Jenny Todd, Nate Heck, and Andy Keller. We're going to learn more about them in the intros, so without further ado, please enjoy this special episode of Obsessed with Design with Jenny Todd, Nate Heck, and Andy Keller. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm excited to have uh, all these folks join us today. They're um, just mega creatives. They... um, I sh- I'm going to have a video here to introduce everyone. Uh, they each, it's a long video because they each have like five jobs each. Um, so there's a lot of, I wanted you guys to actually see some of their stuff. So um, this will introduce them, but also show some of their work. And then we'll go into just a panel discussion and Josh here will kind of lead us off and ask the questions. Uh, this will also be recorded uh, live um, for his podcast, which is Obsessed with Design. So be sure to check that out later, especially you know if you didn't get notes or anything, you, or tell your friends about it if you got a lot out of the session. Um, so that'll be up in, what, a week or two? Something like that. So keep an eye out for that. Also, he's got lots of other awesome uh, podcasts on there as well. So um, definitely check out Obsessed with Design. So I'll kick this off. Josh Miles. Josh Miles is an entrepreneur, author, strategist, marketer, vlogger, and podcast host, and self-described caffeine and Twitter addict. He serves as Vice President of Marketing for SMPS, the Society for Marketing Professional Services. He also works as the Chief Marketing Officer for Codelicious, overseeing brand strategy and messaging. Josh co-founded Miles Herndon, a local branding agency and has served as an art director and adjunct faculty for three university graphic design programs. He is the author of Bold Brand 2.0. Josh also hosts two podcasts, Obsessed with Design and Professional Services Marketing. Josh was honored with the 2016 Emerging Voice Award by Purdue University. Jenny Todd. Jenny Todd is a graduate of our very own Heron School of Art here at IUPUI with a degree in visual communications. She is a creative professional with six plus years of experience providing strategic thinking and design solutions for clients from small businesses to established corporations and everything in between. She is the co-owner of Indie Coffee Roasters where she leads brand and marketing efforts, a senior art director at Well Done Marketing and runs her own design and branding shop, Jenny Todd Creative. She thrives on collaboration between other talented marketing and creative professionals with experience working with writers, digital strategists, developers, project managers, and other creatives. Her skills include creative direction, concept design, brand, art direction, layout and print design, typography, packaging, and photography. Andy Keller Andy is a web and software interface consultant for several local and national brands including the Indianapolis Colts, Fusion, Alliance, and Avant Healthcare, among others. He began freelancing full-time in 2008 
After four seasons with the Colts as a web designer and developer, and several years as a technical project manager, Andy specializes in functional design and front-end development, which allows him to be versatile in client needs and knowledgeable in consulting. Andy earned a bachelor's degree in business systems, MIS, from Taylor University in 2001. Andy and his wife, Jenny, have three daughters, Lauren, Jillian, and Clara, and a son, Griffin. Nate Heck Nate Heck is an artist, educator, and storyteller. He has worked in multimedia development, consulting, web design, technology, and education. As an educator, Nate witnessed the continual reduction in art education and resources in public schools. He was determined to creatively make and deliver content to his audience. In 2012, he began production of Art Rageous, a television series exploring creativity and culture using a unique blend of on-location filming and upbeat animation. Art Rages is a five-time Emmy award-winning program with exemplary video production techniques and intriguing content. Now in its sixth year of production, Nate travels the globe showcasing creative genius and exploring the role that creativity plays in innovation. You might also find him working in his treehouse office or ziplining with kids armed with paint-filled super soakers for his next Art Rages project. Creativity is everywhere. It is woven throughout history, from the creatives of the past to today's engineers, designers, and artists. Who comes up with all these ideas, and where do they shape them into reality? To understand the people that created these things, we have to understand the culture and places around them. Outrageous with Nate travels the globe, showcasing creative geniuses from the past and today. The places that inspired them and that flourished as hotspots of ingenuity. Creativity weaves itself through history, and we want to figure out where is it coming from? Is the secret creating outside or in your garage? Wherever you see innovation and creativity, that is where you'll find us. That's outrageous. Please give everybody a welcome. All right. Thanks for being here today, guys. So because this is uh, going into the podcast, it normally starts a little something like this. Welcome to Obsessed with Design, a show about what makes designers tick. I'm your host, Josh Miles. You've already met our panelists today, and uh, thank you, big thank you to the IUPUI Computer Graphics Technology Department to uh, have us hosted here for this week, and excited to hear about all the other events that are happening. So we're gonna jump off today. We'll get started with uh, Jenny Todd. And Jenny, and for those of you who might have ever listened to the show before, always like to start with origin stories. So want to understand how you found yourself, not just in this chair today, but how you found yourself in this world of design and creativity. Give us a little background. Yeah, i um, excited to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, my origin story isn't too crazy, um, but I started out loving art and um, drawing and those kinds of things when I was a little kid, like probably a lot of us. Uh, I did a lot of art projects with my dad growing up. He was the other creative in the family. And um, I always knew I loved it, but wasn't sure how I might tie it into a career one day. Um, that kind of came full circle when I was in high school. I actually got a great opportunity to work with a photographer who was looking for an assistant at the time. Um, little did I know that that would kind of lead to starting my first ever design projects, which was a lot of senior graduation announcements and uh, album photo albums and uh, my first ever Every time opening Photoshop. <laughs> uh, the high art of the senior graduating album. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I did a lot of those projects and it actually started to get me really interested in design. I started to look at what other work was out there and just see if I could actually make it in Photoshop. Um, and uh, then I started to want to create my own pieces of art 
and uh, utilize a lot of those skills that I had learned from kind of starting out by imitating and seeing what was possible. So that's kind of led me to uh, then go to school for it and uh, enter it, enter into it as a career. And just to level set, you know, my first real commercial design job was they used to like print the internet on this yellow paper and it was called the Yellow Pages. I, I know most of our audience here has never seen a Yellow Pages before, but that was, that was my first design job. So Nate, tell us a little bit about your origin story as well. Um, yeah, very, very similar to, to yours, probably. Uh, um, I'd say, I don't know, in elementary school, yeah, same thing as I like to tell people. Um, I did third grade twice, um, so I killed it. <laughs> uh, I did not do well in school, but art was my thing, and that was the only place I felt like I had a home. Um, and so I started doing that, and then luckily, uh, I think because I was told I would work in a gas station, was what my counselor said, because I was skipping class. And um, Yeah, anyway, long story short, went to college and then decided I needed to be a teacher. Um, so I was a teacher for like a solid 10 years, which is crazy. Um, I taught everything. I taught here at IUPUI for a while, to high schools. I taught in France for a while, um, which tied into starting uh, Outrageous. But long story short, I just one day was looking for a video series. And as you can imagine, I decided to put myself in front of a green screen just to play. And I showed it to the kids, even though I was standing in the room. It did not matter. They were way more glued to the TV of me and standing in front of a painting, talking. Anyway. Um, so I just realized I just wanted to create something. And I don't know, my wife and I played around with the idea and um, started Outrageous probably six and a half years ago. Um, but really decided to jump full in about five years ago. Um, and really, my goal was, uh, yeah, it's, it's not so much the art at all. And I mean, it's deceptive because I can't even do that. Uh, we got kicked out of that paint slip, uh, the zip line <laughs> thing. Uh, we had paint all over their equipment and stuff. I felt kind of bad. But anyway, um, but it was fun. So yeah, so I mean, it's really more focused on creativity uh, and where it's coming from and innovation. Hence, your podcast is an awesome fit. So yeah, so that's kind of uh, led us to where we're at now. Awesome. Love it. Andy Keller? Uh, we, we saw lots of Colts.com there and yeah. mostly lots of cheerleaders. That's yes. I, for some reason, that really stood out to me. That's but right. tell us a little bit about your background and how you found yourself in this position. Yeah, well, similar probably to, to these guys, but also to, all of, to many of you probably is that I uh, grew up loving art and um, was just always interested in it. I love going to the art, art class and sketching and, and uh, did portraits of my parents, you know, when I, when, I was little and um, just grew up doing that, but when I got to high school, uh, similar to Jenny, but in a different track, I got enrolled in a uh, architectural preparation program, which was a really cool program. It was, uh, I learned um, computer-aided, learned drafting and then computer-aided drafting and um, actually learned, um, well, I was just fascinated by architecture and um, so did some independent study and really kind of went down more of a uh, one, well, one of the cool things about architecture is that it's a um, it's it's almost like solving problems through um, design, and uh, so it was really kind of my first um, insight into how design can solve problems, and um, and then so really more of also a functional design um, background as well. So went from there. Um, Everything else really was self-taught. It wasn't um, really institutionalized or anything, but it was through a um, through getting books and going through tutorials and getting Photoshop and going through Photoshop tutorial and figuring out how to cut somebody out and doing all those types of things. So it was sort of the beginning, and it's just been a learning process ever since. Since then, so I like hearing that you're not a domesticated designer. That you no, are that's right. wild, that's feral, right. yes, designer. Exactly. That's Do you right. think? Um, you know, studying architecture, how do you think that was like applied to what you do today from a web design and development standpoint? Do you feel like there's some overlaps there? I, I do, really. Um, I think that I'm probably not as much of a, uh, I wouldn't consider myself as a creative as like even these two are, but um, I'm probably more of, um, I think, a lot of web design is solving problems. So, uh, for instance, a lot of uh, companies will want to increase their um, click-through rates, or they want to get more people to buy their products. And so, you're you're trying to find ways to meet those goals. And I think, similar to architecture, it's like um, you think of like falling waters, like the built the home that it was kind of built into this this 
rock and this, these waters that fell down. It was like solving this problem and uh, through design, bringing in, um, like combining the two. So I don't know, it's, um, I think there's a lot of similarities there. Well, maybe specifically, Jenny, this applies to you um, being a partner in a, in a coffee company and having a website that has calls to action and trying to get people to do things. How, how does that apply to kind of your side of the design world? Yeah, I mean, um, running a, our own small business is very much um, about how can we be successful as a company, how can we get customers to learn about us, and also how can we get them to take the actions that we want, especially on our website, which is to come in and visit, to purchase coffee online, all of those kinds of things. And so I think there is a really unique side of design, even visual design, which is more of what I do, that is about how, how do we successfully take someone through this journey of um, starting on a website or opening a piece of printed material that you've read and how do we get them from point A to point B? And so a lot of times that takes creative problem solving to figure out what's that path and how do we lead them through the piece. Um, similarly to the website, you know, it was a lot about how do we design this website so that we uh, capture people that come to our homepage and we lead them through kind of this customer journey, this user experience to then get them to purchase our coffee online. So, um, and there would be similar, you know, correlations as well to the actual space and designing um, the flow of the inside of the shop to do a similar thing. So. Cool. Let's transition a little bit, Nate. If um, we're thinking about you, maybe, maybe there's no such thing as a typical day for you, but if you're in a day that you're just in the flow and you're just rocking it, what's that look like for you? Um, wow. Well, first, Adobe, if I'm on Adobe, would work properly. I was swearing like a sailor last night at Adobe. <laughs> I give them half, I say a mortgage payment. Um, but anyway, point being, I, I don't know, you know, it's kind of like what you were saying here is that, um, you know, it's kind of like I have to do whatever needs to be done at that moment. So whether that's web design, and you know, I was in InDesign the other day or I'm animating and I don't mind doing those things, but I guess a perfect day is when, you know, you, it's the combination of like, I've prepared, pre-produced, we've got everybody, and we have a full on staff. And then, um, I mean, for me, my hot moment is either we're on location with someone. So whether that's we're filming somewhere or um, I spent the summer doing pre-production where it's, we're, you know, we're actually in it. So you're actually getting to do the thing that we have spent months and months trying to plan, trying to, you know, all, all the nuts and bolts. So a perfect day would either be yes, like Adobe or After Effects would properly not shut down um, on me. That's a perfect day to be <laughs> honest sometimes. Um, and just, yeah, being able to finally do the thing that you work so hard to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Andy, how about you? Well, um, I think one of the reasons why I'm doing freelance and I'm, I'm a little more independent is I don't like uh, to be in a corporate office from, from eight to five. And so any day that I'm able to move around and, um, well, honestly, so um, if, I, if I can wake up, go down to my office downstairs and, you know, I've got a stand up desk and I can got a big monitor and I can turn the music up and just be in my own, you know, place. It's like, that's, that's a great day of, you know, just getting stuff done, getting stuff checked off. And um, at the end of the day, I'm like, yeah, that feels like a pretty good day. And I think also even if you can mix in a little indie coffee roasters and get, get into the, <laughs> get in there and get some coffee and, and um, just even go into a coffee shop or something as well. Um, just having that flexibility for me is like, is huge. And so, um, you know, a good day is when I can look back and say, yeah, I got a lot done and I uh, was able to kind of be a little more free. Excellent. Well, I'm sort of an addict too, caffeine yeah. addict myself. I so think we all are. Visits right? in the last <laughs> two days, right? I might have seen you over there yesterday. That's right. Um, it was yesterday. Yeah. So Jenny, when you're in the flow, what's a good day look like for you? Yeah. Um, so for me, I realized probably about a year ago that the best days for me start out with uh, working out in the mornings. So it just really like kicks off my day for me. It gets me up and going and active and um, kind of allows me to feel like I've accomplished something already. So I can look back even halfway through the day and say, well, I might not have gotten everything done I wanted to or things might not have gone how I expected, but I at least finished that and accomplished it. So that's been really great for me. Um, and then from there, I mean, similarly to, to all of these guys up here, but um, I am doing something different all the time, which is another reason why I love what I do is just that I 
maybe like things to uh, not be the same every single day. I like routine, but I don't like repetition all the time. So um, it's a lot of meeting with clients, meeting with other creatives. Like I think I did see both of you guys at the coffee shop yesterday. Um, so meeting with other creatives, working with clients, um, brainstorming new ideas, and then a little bit of heads down time that's actually spent working and creating, designing, sketching, those kinds of things. Um, obviously, a trip to Indie Coffee Roasters is an absolute must. Um, <laughs> there's, there's just so many people there I love seeing too and uh, being around other people I really do enjoy, although I have such a flexible schedule with what I do. Um, it's nice to, to be around other people that are kind of sharing in the load of what you're doing as well. So just being able to kind of go through that life with others and, and uh, share maybe successes or failures that have happened throughout the day. So. so most of us, myself included, have done kind of the combination of working for yourself and working at a corporate job. And, um, you know, even a lot of us on the stage today are kind of juggling those things. Like, how do you do things for yourself, make time for yourself, and still do the things that you need to do for your for your day-to-day -day job? Um, maybe talk through a little bit of, of the process of that or the thinking of that. Like, why, why are you where you are right now? Andy, do you want to, and especially in the context of, we've got a room full of creative students here and a lot of our audience is young, both students and young professionals in the design space. So who might be in a similar boat of, you know, do I, do I go out on my own? Do I do I try to do both, or do I go with you know what feels like the secure job for now? So maybe kind of talk through that piece a little bit. Yeah, I think um, I always kind of had that itch to sort of to, to go on my own. I, th I think um, even when I was I had a probably my dream job. I was with the Colts for three for three or four seasons and was just loving it. That was just it was so cool. But even then, I, I sort of uh, there were those little things like. Um, you know, being somewhere at eight in the morning and being there at five in the afternoon and, and having to stay even when you're not really that busy and, um, or, you know, when I've been in other corporate or corporate type offices where, you know, you just kind of feel like, ah, I'm in a cube. I don't know. This isn't really what I want to do. And I, so I think I always sort of had that itch of just like, ah, I, I feel like I can do these things, um, on my own and I can get, paid for it if I'm putting in overtime or if I'm putting in the extra time we're doing. And um, so I can get the benefit of that, of that side of it too. So um, for me, kind of that transition, um, it was scary and it was, um, but I, I sort of knew that I just needed to do it and I needed to get through the hard stuff in order to, for the good stuff to come later. So, um, and I'm really glad that I did it. Um, but looking back now and I, and I have been, you know, given offers to, to go work for somebody. And it, it's always that, that idea that, man, I just don't, I just don't know if I can give up the, that, um, just that flexibility and that freedom. So that was a big thing for me. And, um, I, you know, you just kind of like figure it out. You just sort of work it out. And those, those things of balance, I mean, you just have to figure it out to make it happen. So. Yeah, a lot of people talk about getting that itch. I really think that's from the khakis and the cube. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> that's yeah. what creates the itch. But, yeah. Uh, Nate, how about you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I would say, you know, at the end of the day, it's, as, as my mom often will tell me, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Um, and that's truth of it, you know. And I think it's, you know, a lot of people will come to me and go, oh, you're living your dream job. And I'm like, yeah, but, I mean, it's not been easy. And it's not a dream job still. I mean, I'm still fighting often, you know, to do kind of like that to keep the schedule. I mean, um, I had an office outside. I mean, I worked in a school, so that wasn't terrible outside of sometimes the kids. But, um, but yeah, I work in a treehouse. So it's not, I mean, it's, if you're ever in <laughs> Irvington, you are more than welcome to stop by. Uh, but if we're not on location, I mean, it's, I want that choice. Um, but to get that, the hardest thing, really, I'll be honest, the, the elephant in the room for me is insurance. I have three kids and I have a family. And one thing in Entrepreneur Book 101, which doesn't exist yet, is uh, what do you do if you own your own business and you need insurance? Um, and so I have been consulting for Apple for seven years now. Um, don't get me wrong, I love Apple. But um, it's been nuts trying to juggle all of that. But it's a choice. And it's like, you know, as I always say, I don't try not to complain about it because it's kind of like it comes with it. You know, I want to create a show and to inspire people to be more creative and innovative and to do that, you know, there's, it's not the easiest thing, but, um, yeah, but juggling all of that is, you know, the flexibility. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's been, I did, so I was in France with my family doing pre-production 
all summer long. So, I mean, I don't know that I could have done that if I couldn't be able to, you know, that's the great part, right? World digital. I can work literally anywhere in the world, uh, which is awesome. And stuff gets smaller, more expensive, um, and more powerful. So, um, the toys get more awesome, so that allows more flexibility. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not been easy. But like you said, I mean, I get a job offer or something, but yet... I, I mean, I'm walking 30 feet to my treehouse with my coffee as we're all addicted here. I, I can't, I don't want to trade that. Um, and it's, it's a, but there is a price to pay, so to speak, uh, to keep that. Yeah, and at least it's, it's an insured treehouse, so it's, it's good. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not insured enough yet. So, Jenny, you have the unique balance of a job and a business that you're running and freelance as well, so... Talk to us a little bit about your juggling act. Yeah, I've honestly had uh, the unique privilege of finding some really amazing companies here in Indianapolis that have really moved into that more flexible mod model of allowing employees to work from home and allowing people to come and go as they need to. And I think there's a lot more of those kind of popping up as the um, you know digital space is really growing here in Indy, the tech space, uh, agencies are a lot more flexible. And so I think it's just honestly a matter of finding a place where you feel equal balances of flexibility, um, but stability and um, insurance is always great too. So um, yeah, I work for Well Done Marketing and they're an amazing company that allows me to work from anywhere whenever I need to. And so that's been... Um, uh, such an amazing opportunity for me to be able to work from the business that I also own. Um, it's a little bit unique in that I do own a coffee roasting company and a coffee shop, so it's the perfect place to spend an afternoon. And so that also allows me to then be present at my business that I also need to be available for certain things that pop up. Um, but my company has been amazing at allowing me to to do what I need to do, and I think there's a lot of those out there as well. Um, and then there's there's obviously you know extra hours I'm putting in outside of the nine to five during the day where I'm also working for my business and my freelance work. So it's a juggling act for sure, and you figure out how to make it work for you and your family. And I hang out with my son for the two hours I see him after after school, and then I work when he goes to bed. So you know you uh, you figure out how to make it work. Yeah, and just in case you missed that, she's a mom too. So this is there's at least at least one other topic, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, Nate, if if you had to list somebody as sort of a, a design inspiration or a creativity hero for you, any anybody that comes to mind? All right, I'm not gonna lie, Steve Jobs. I mean, he was a jerk, but um, the way he retreated. But I mean, the man was a design. I mean, I, so yeah, I mean, a lot of our, even our logo, I mean, I think a lot about design all the time, about contrast, color, et cetera, visual. I mean, it's, I tell people that I work with, it's all moving photos, right? I mean, that's what it is. So um, yeah, beyond that, you know, um, John Arnold, he's a, he runs a, he does AR development here. You sound like you know him. Um, in Indy, if you want to look up somebody who's got more creativity spilling out of him, he's somebody I've always looked up to, does AR, I and mean, he just like explodes creativity. So Locally, he's kind of my go-to for ideas. And uh, yeah, on an animation standpoint, um, I love to animate. Um, same with you. It's literally was like out of necessity, just self kind of taught. But um, I love Walt Disney. I'm not a Walt Disney World something else. We'll talk about it later. But um, as an animator and an innovator, I mean, I, if you read his book, and uh, the man was crazy awesome. And so as I, I kind of think about keeping it simple. Um, and so, yeah, those are probably the three for me. Cool. Yeah, John Arnold, if you're listening, we might have to have you on the show here in a future episode. I can show up on it. All right. Jenny, who's a designer, creativity hero in your book? Yeah, that's such a hard question because I think there's so many amazingly talented designers and creative people out there. All of those people that you just named, I'm like, oh, yeah, those are, those are really you know inspiring people. Um, when it comes specifically to design, uh, Jessica Hish is a huge inspiration for me. She has just perfected kind of this art of typography and lettering and creating kind of her own style and visual representation of things that I think is amazing. Um, Lo locally, Amy McAdams is a huge inspiration to me. She's been kind of a mentor for me over the last 
gosh, probably three to five years. She's also a mom and runs a business. And so I find a lot of inspiration from, from that side of her life and how she balances that also with um, just being an amazingly talented designer. So um, Tad Carpenter is another great guy. I know he was on your podcast as well. Um, branding, he's just top notch. And illustration, children's book illustration, which I've been kind of itching to do a little bit. So uh, I've been really inspired by that with him. Uh, I could go on and on. But those are, those are a few that, that uh, come to the top of my mind. I approve of all of those. Andy Keller? Yeah, I actually, Nate touched on a couple of them that I, that I was thinking. But um, uh, <laughs> not to harp on this architectural thing, but I really, I studied Frank Lloyd Wright for a year, and I um, like a lot of his stuff, and a, a few other architects. And I, um, I just, you know, the way that they would, again, solve problems, and the way that they would, um, you know, see something and make it into something just... Um, I don't know, just amazing, you know, the, those were things that really, uh, that inspired me and things that I've learned a ton from in my early, early uh, stages of learning, so. You know, I talk about um, design and creativity a lot as sort of that scene in The Matrix where Neo's got the chance to take either pill, and then once you've sort of studied and paid attention to design, you can't ever see the world the same again. So, Andy, when you think about maybe trends or common things that you see in the in the web design development space right now what's something that drives you crazy that most people wouldn't notice Ooh, gosh. <laughs> <You're> like, oh. <laughs> crazy. Oh. oh man um yeah they're just stuff like it's just so much like <laughs> we kind of shifted we went from um overly designed to very minimal um, and we kind of came back, came back up you know so it, we, it's always a trend there's always something you know something going on in that world but um, we're kind of getting back to that where uh, there's just more just put as much stuff on there as you can you know and uh, and so that drives me nuts because it because I think there's a balance there it's like um, I feel like some we kind of went a little too minimalistic for a while and then you know, before that, it was just way too much. So, um, I feel like, you know, that's really it drives me crazy. And I, I work a little bit with, um, uh, like, I, like I said, the Colts and with the Star. And it's there's always, you know, how do you, how do you monetize these websites? And so, typically, it's well, you put somebody's logo on it. You know, you get a corporate sponsor, you get, um, you know, a sandwich shop, and and they say, okay, we want to sponsor this program, and so let's put let's get their logo on there, and then the, the logo is never big enough, and and so you you know it's just like it just gets muddy really quickly, and so that's just always the the difficult part is um, solving like for both to make the corporate sponsor happy, and then and then to make to make it visually appealing and all of that. So um, yeah, but I feel like we're kind of that drives me nuts a little bit. Like we're kind of going back to that a little bit, and I'd like to keep it on the minimal side if we can, but it's difficult. Nate, anything that stands out to you in the world of film and video and storytelling? I mean, uh, yeah, there's there's that and design, and oh wow, it's like so many different things running through my mind. But yeah, I mean, I think people underestimate design, right? The importance of it, which is why, to be honest with you, we switched from, you know, we were being pigeonholed into art. And that kind of made people think, well, I'm not an artist. And I'm like, but creativity, marketing, all that's an art form, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I tell everybody, everybody markets. You all sell. Like what I do, 90, I'm, I'm selling an idea. Um, so how important it is, and I usually like Steal Like an Artist, one of the greatest books, um, great book, um, or some Daniel Pink books. But I always tell people, I'm like, you know, I think we forget how important design is because like the last uh, statistic I heard was if you added up every college graduate in a year in the U.S., that, just that number is how many engineers get pumped out, graduate in India, and so, which is amazing, but what, our niche is design, right? I mean, if I'm gonna make a website, it's gotta look good, it can't be back end. I mean, both ends of the mm -hmm. spectrum are important. So, I think that's where I get really excited, is seeing, and, and showing, like, the back end design, if you're doing, you know, coding, et cetera, is just as sexy, <laughs> you know, it needs to be, as the front, and I think that's where I get really excited is trying to show people that um, design creativity, it, I mean, it's weaving itself through every profession. Um, it's just a matter of whether you're seeing it that way. So, yeah, super important. I wouldn't even go into the 
weird world of video. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, any uh, trends or things that stick out to you that just drive you crazy? Oh, man. Um, I would say the biggest thing that drives me crazy just in design in general, I don't know if this is maybe a trend, but is kind of actually what Andy hit on, which is just the idea that when you're designing anything, that anything and everything needs to be on that one piece of designed material. Um, I think that we underestimate the, the power that the viewer has to interpret what we mean. And I think that a lot of times we assume that people don't get it and they do they understand and they are familiar with the ways in which the world is going with iconography and visuals and imagery and things that can represent others other things and so I think that's my my biggest oh, thing that just drives me crazy is when when a, a client maybe says well I need it to have all of this copy and all of this vision all of these visuals this imagery and all these other things too and usually I have to say okay what's the message what are we trying to accomplish here what are we what what one thing do we want someone to take away from this and let's make sure that that is clear yeah, and then they want all that above the fold. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> I they want, want it bigger. I don't have to scroll on my phone, but I want to see all this stuff and then make it all bigger. Yeah, I always told clients that um, your crowded, busy, confusing website is not the problem. It's the symptom of the business problem, which is you guys can't agree what's important. You can't agree to the what's the what's the most important message. Yeah. So, um, Jenny, what would you say um, to date is your your proudest moment as a designer? Ooh, I love that question. I had to think about that one a little. I have to think about that a little bit. But um, I think the one thing that stands out to me is the day that I saw the Indie Coffee Roasters sign up and in real life outside of our, our business. Um, I obviously created our brand as well, but it was kind of something that my husband and I had been dreaming about for a long time. We started the business in 2013, and back then it was just like my husband was roasting coffee on a whirly pop, and he was like, hey, our friend wants to buy a bag of roasted coffee and I need something to put on there that says what it is. And so I created a brand at that time. I was early on in my branding career um, and it was pretty terrible, but um, <laughs> it is it has come a long way since. And so I think seeing kind of the fruits of all of our hard work as well as the growth that I had seen in my career of branding kind of come to fruition as we pulled up and saw the sign for the first time uh, in real life, I think that was probably my my proudest brand and uh, design moment. Nate, how about you? What's your proudest moment so far? Um, Trying to keep it in line with the design thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess from uh, oh, go off the rails if you want. I, I know. Well, I mean, side note would be uh, if you know Wicked, um, getting convincing someone, especially when I was working for PBS, that hey, let me in to do an interview with you is not an easy task. Um, and there's so many hoops, it's ridiculous. So, uh, but I, I will say, Edward Pierce, he was the guy who designed Wicked's set, and we were at Wicked and Phantom of the Opera. And, um, we showed up, and I'm just geeking out that we're even there. And I mean, I'll, I'll say this is, a, I feel like I'm bragging, but you asked. So, um, but we showed up, and Edward, um, like I said, he designed that one, and he designed the one that's, I think, out over in uh, London. But uh, he has kids, and he knew, he had watched all the episodes. He knew who I was more than I knew him, <laughs> which I felt really embarrassed. But it was like a moment of, holy crap, like somebody knows something I made. And he was, we were excited. I mean, we, we kind of geeked out. A little too much hugging, but yeah, I'd say it was a really proud moment of like, oh, wow. um, but as a designer, yeah, I mean, I think it's those moments from the design aspect of when you, you know, I, I'm out of money, I have to, I just have to do it all. You know, you're like, where you speak of, you know, getting the Photoshop skills back out, you know, um, I green screen a lot of times, I just to say money in my basement. So if you come over, it's like basement's the green screen, treehouse is editing. So, um, you know, and I love those moments when people assume you've got some massive budget and you know, and you're like, no, like, I, I, you laugh. You're like, I literally just did that. Um, and some of the shots on that little thing, uh, when I'm walking through is uh, Rodin's museum, that's my nine-year-old son who just walking with uh, a, a camera behind me. So, I mean, I just love those moments when you're like, it's, no, it's pretty simple. Um, so those are really proud design moments, I guess. So. Nice. You get paid scale for running the camera that day? Yeah, it's slave labor for my son. <laughs> Candy, usually, or ice cream. 
<laughs> Andy, what's your favorite moment or proudest moment as a designer? Well, um, I was thinking a couple of years ago, I uh, forced myself, and I think, um, you know, typically the landscaper's lawn never looks great or whatever, but uh, I forced myself to make myself a website that had just had my portfolio and um, some work that I had done. And I think, like, things every day just move so quickly that you just don't have a lot of time to stop and really think about, like, to be proud of a project that you just did. You just kind of move on to the next thing, and you just keep going. And um, But I, it was sort of a retrospective look at, wow, what, you know, the last 15 years of some of the work that I did. And some of it was just terrible, and I, you know, but then some of it I'm like, hey, man, I got to work with T and, or TBS, or I got to work with IndyStar, or like these cool people or companies or, you know, that you just don't stop and think about every once in a while. Like, yeah, some people don't even get, like, one of these opportunities, you know, or get, you know, get to do whatever. So um, just to see some of the work um, going through that process was actually a really kind of a, gave me a chance to be, to be proud of it, I guess, for a minute. When you look at that and think, well, I've actually been doing some stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Check it out. Yeah, yeah I've been looking totally. at that for a while. I know. So I guess fast forward to the the end of your career or kind of your bucket list as a creative, you know, what's that that one thing that's that's on your bucket list or what's the thing that you hope to be able to look back and go, yeah, I accomplished this. What's what's that for you, Andy? Hmm. Um, I don't know if mine's necessarily um, specifically design related. I think I would say... Um, um, I step back for a second, and my I've been actually been thinking about this the last couple of years because my my uh, parents both retired just recently, and so my dad had a, his own business for uh, 40 years, and it was just him, and he occasionally had an employee, and um, but my dad's customers love my dad. It's like they just they just he's good to them. He's he's kind. He treats them well. He he's fair. You know all those things, and you know if you look at the next door app he's like one of the top rated in his industry you know and, I, and all of that is because of who he is and um, I kind of look at that and I go you know when I'm done I kind of want to I want to say yeah I did good work but I also was good to people and I was fair and I treated people right and um, you know and people have more of those kind of recollections of, of who I was in my career than than really anything specifically design related that I would have done great answer Oh, sorry, that's, that's good. Sorry. Yeah, it's good. Moment there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess, you know, at the end of the day, um, my, my, I think my goal is I want to help inspire people. Um, and so, you know, I think part of my, my short term, you know, you have the short term and long term goals. I think short term, it's been trying to, you know, make something sustainable, right? As a business, that's probably one of the hardest things is to get it to a sustainable point where it's like, I'll be honest, production's not cheap. It's nuts, which is why wearing many hats. I think if I had advice, that's where it's like, if you don't know how to do it, don't sit on it. Just figure it out. Like, um, I think the creative problem-solving aspect's really fun. Um, I think my, what my goal is really, at the end of the day, I mean, there's so much entertainment. I mean, I fight that. I call it kitty cats and putting gummy worms in blender videos. I mean, my kids watch this garbage, so don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm fighting against that. So if I'm out there like, I want to teach you something, people are like, Pfft whatever kitty cat on a rumba give it to me um it's, it's the world i'm living in right so that's tough so i think what my goal is right now and i changed our show was because somebody may say i love frida kahlo oh, i love frida kahlo and i'm like you love frida kahlo it's awesome do you know what made her her and that is her culture and um i love culture i love travel it's like my favorite thing on the planet um outside my family i should say but point being is um i really want people to understand these creatives, innovators, artists, where they come from. And I think you've got to understand the culture, which I hope, my goal, I think, at the end is that um, beyond, hopefully, in doing some entertainment, but to inspire people to get to know people better and to get to know their background better um, and to be, I'll be honest, less judgmental. And I think if you, want, if you love the work of this designer and you don't know where they came from, you're missing, right? Your story, their story. So I think hopefully I can expose some people to that. That's great. I love the culture piece. Jenny, looking back, what do you want to what do you want to look back on and think, man, I, I did that. What's what's that future thing for you? Yeah, a couple things come to mind. Um, the first is that I 
uh, kind of, I mean, similarly to what these guys have sort of shared is that I have been saying a lot lately that I really just want to do work for people who are making a difference in the world. I think that right now we need it more than ever. We need people who are hardworking and who are doing good for others and who are helping make the world better. And so uh, for me, I really just want to be able to look back and say, yeah, I think I did my part to help these other businesses and these other creative people and these other uh, industries, people in industries doing great things. I helped them further the cause and and be able to do more great work. Uh, so that's a big one for me. The other thing that's been kind of more recent that might not be uh, too far in the future, but um, especially with my son who is uh, just getting ready to turn one, I've really been inspired to uh, create a children's book. So uh, that's something I definitely want to look back on and be able to say that I accomplished. Uh, I think especially I kind of have this picture in my head of seeing him sitting down reading it. So just the idea that I could create something that then he could really be involved with and experience and hopefully learn from. And I want to be able to share with him so many of the things that I've learned even in my short lifetime uh, that I think will will inspire him as he grows up. So you've got like, you know, three or four years till he's old enough to read himself. So, <laughs> exactly. so there's your timeline. Right. Most, yeah. most designers need a deadline and then <laughs> nothing like a deadline to get you going. Nate, I'm going to go to you first on this one. We've had a lot of good advice from the three of you today, just sort of naturally. But I'm curious what either is your favorite piece of advice that you've received or maybe your favorite piece of advice to pass along to, especially to young creatives. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I know for myself, when I very uh, quit my job and I started working with um, PBS uh, out in Washington and starting, and I, you know, you're just like, I just, what do I got to do? Like, I'll work my butt off to get this successful. Um, you know, who do I got to have? You know, what do I have to do? And I remember one of the pieces of advice they gave me, they're like, the average time from incubation to succeed is six years. And they're like, and I'm actually coming up right on it. So it's make or break. Um, <laughs> but it's truth. I mean, I think in the design world or, you know, create, you just, you assume it's like green light, I'm making six figures, you know, and um, you don't realize how much work it takes. And, you know, if somebody sees you as an overnight success, but you know, it took five years to get there, it's okay. Like, that's fine. I'll take that. Um, beyond that, I think is just, uh, I know the piece of advice I give usually is, I love when I go to schools and I tell them, I don't care if you become an artist. Um, and I think it's just, and they're always like, what? Um, but the point of being is like, Everybody's creative, you know, and I think that's the thing. That, um, don't underestimate it. School works it out of you sometimes, and that's what's great about the departments you guys are in is that I feel that it's like blending and keeping that measure of creativity in there um, and seeing it as something not just painting, drawing, et cetera. So um, keep doing what you're doing. I mean, if you're here, you're obviously motivated. So thanks for coming. Excellent. And this, this room just keeps getting fuller as we go. <laughs> Andy, so what's your favorite piece of advice either that you've received or your favorite one to pass along? I like what Nate said there, and it just from, um, and I have my own, but even just what Nate said, just about um, just that hard work and that, that time that it takes sometimes, because I just remember those early days and years, a couple, the first couple of years where it was just like I was taking on anything that I could take on, and my rates were extremely low, and I was just doing whatever I could just to get work and to just to build a reputation and once I did that then I could kind of creep my rates up a little bit and do a little bit less projects and all that so um, sometimes yeah it takes takes some time to do it but you get through those hard things and and, it, and there's a payoff um, if you are doing the right things and treating people well but I, another point another thought I had was really to um, uh, to diversify really with with your clients and with your um, skill set. So I think um, you'll drive yourself crazy if you just go from project to project to project and not knowing what the next project's gonna be. Um, I, if you um, try to diversify your, your clients from a, um, this might be, you know, I might have like three, or my goal might be like, hey, I want to have two large clients or three large clients that kind of keep me going and then maybe um, a bunch of medium clients and then a bunch more little clients that might call you every three three months or so. That kind of balance um, can really help you stay sane and uh, can can ease a lot of that pressure because um, it, it can be a little scary, especially when you have a family or you have a house or whatever and you're trying to pay the bills and try to get through it. So... Um, 
diversifying clients, but I think also also diversifying your skill set because I, I started really just doing design work and I realized that um, if I, you know, to become a better designer, I should probably learn to develop what I'm doing. And so I, I it's sort of um, over the over the years how I've transitioned and, and built more of a development um, uh, portfolio, I guess, that that I realized that that's actually helped my design eye, knowing that what it takes to develop that sort of thing, and, and vice versa too, has helped me for, to become a better developer, having been a, um, done quite a bit of design work. So um, I would say that that would be, diversification would be a big piece of advice. All this diversification talk, you might have missed your calling as an investment advisor, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, Jenny, we're gonna start with you on this one. Did you already give your best piece of advice? You didn't do that. I don't think well, I we're going to, instead, we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go okay, to cool. Andy with the next question. Awesome. Um, I think I have a couple of things, and I think I've probably been told these at times, but I think I also share them with others. But the first is show more of and share more of the kind of work you want to do. So it seems like a simple idea, but. At the end of the day, a lot of times, you know, especially when I was starting out, I would share the things I was doing just because I was doing them. Um, and then I was getting more of that kind of work. And I'm sitting here thinking, why are people just coming to me for that? I can do so much more. And it's because that's what they were seeing. And that's what they assumed that I did, you know, the best. And so if there's something you want to do, like animation, just get up and make something and share it and get get your work out there and get out there the stuff that you want to then get more work for. Um, so that was a big one for me. And then I would say the other one is just, this is such a simple idea, but has reigned so true in my career is like comparison is just the thief of joy. Like I sit back and compare myself to all of these heroes that I have and, and uh, it just stifles me from being better and doing the best work that I can do. Look up to those people for inspiration for what they've done and how they've gotten to where they are and how hard they work. But at the end of the day, you know, do your best and do the work that makes you happy and, and don't look at all these other people and wonder why you're not as good as they are because most of the time they've been doing this for a long time and you're just getting started. So you're not expected to be as good as they are at this point. Yeah, I remember a period, and this was just a couple of years ago, that I, I actually went through a couple of my social feeds where my peers who were just killing it and followed them. Like, not out of spite, not because I don't want to see that because you're doing so awesome. Just, I didn't need that filter. I didn't need that help with the self-talk of yeah. like, we'll see what your peers are doing. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, and, and since then, I've gone back and like, uh, I, I do kind of care to see what they're doing. So, you know, I think once you get to a point of maturity where you're like, okay, I can handle this, I can take it, I, I want the inspiration, I want to be happy for them. But I was just at this point where I was so overwhelmed. I was like, man, I, enough. Yeah, and it's easy to do now with social media and the way that everybody is sharing everything. It's it's awesome, you know, on on this side of the, the spectrum, and then on the other side, it, it can be can be uh, really stifling. So, audience, um, we've got just a handful of questions left. I want you guys to be thinking about what you want to know from this panel. So, we're going to take a couple audience questions at the very end. So. Um, start thinking now if you haven't already write these down we have um, maybe there's free coffee for somebody with I don't know we don't <laughs> I'll, I'll just talk about question. coffee uh, Andy we're gonna go to you uh, with this uh, next to last question which is um, and this doesn't have to be a design or creativity thing Nate so if there's anything that you would answer that's not specific to that anything in life in general but so sort of the premise of obsessed with design is that creatives and designers we're sort of an obsessed bunch we find things and we latch onto it and we just get excited about it whether it's type or coffee or something else but um, I just think this is always such an interesting question is what do you find that you are most obsessed with right now <laughs> I think my questions or my answer is kind of lame um, because <laughs> it's really, I'm in a stage of life where I've got kids that are like 8, 10, 12, and 12. I have twins. And um, it's like, you know, soccer. I mean, tons of stuff. So uh, honestly, the short answer is it's like I feel like if I actually looked at my life from a, it's like my kids are my obsession right now, really. It's just like I'm constantly, I'm, I'm coaching, I'm helping with homework, I'm doing all this stuff. And so anything really I feel like I'm doing outside of 
of my work and and is really kind of revolves around them so it's like it's i don't know it's not i don't think it's sad it's a good thing but it's also like that's man, that's what i'm doing right now so that's that's the stage i'm in I've, once they maybe get in a couple of years i'll i'll move on i i love to i love music i love to i love to drum and you know a few other things and i'll get back into that but right now that's the meat of it for me that's awesome that that is not a lame answer at all nate what are you most obsessed with right now? Oh, wow. My ADD brain is like, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, outside of what uh, you exactly said, which is you're consumed with everything when your kids are in school. Um, but baking, I'm not going to lie. I love baking, creativity. I took a baking class uh, when I was over in France, uh, which was enlightening. And uh, it's probably not good for my health. But anyway, so like, I'm obsessed with that right now. Coffee, I'm always obsessed with as well. Um, Outside of that, I mean, it's just, I'm always obsessed with trying to figure out, like, what's, how can I better engage? So one of the things I'm, this is where John Arnold ties in, is AR. I, I really want to make, museums suck, I'm just going to say it. And that's part of why I started Outrageous. They're boring, it's pretentious. I do not think that artists ever intended their work to be consumed in that manner. Uh, but anyway, so I try to make it more approachable. And one of the things I've been trying to work on is, like, I'm obsessed with trying to figure out how AR, because I see AR becoming... A better, a bigger thing than we can't walk those stupid goggles around. I've done that; it's cool. The whole, but anyway, <laughs> Oculus Rift and all that. But it's just not going to happen. But how can I make an experience, whether it's even outside a museum or in a cult, you know, like using? We were trying to film so that you like pop your phone up, or you know, like you're in a museum, and not that it has to be me, but I, I pop up and I can tell you, like, make that experience more interactive. So I'm really obsessed with trying to figure out where it's headed because. I haven't talked about it, but it is. It's the Wild West. That is digital media right now. It's nuts, you know? Um, I mean, it is. It's, and it's trying to figure out, it's like, it's, it's absolutely bonkers. So trying to figure out how to, you know, with attention spans dropping. And if I make a video over two minutes, people freak out. But if I don't overview an artist, a designer, et cetera, and do the whole, I get slayed on, inter on social media. So... It's, it's a hard balance of trying to figure out where everything's going. Um, so I don't know where I got off topic there. Again, I warned you with the ADD thing. But certainly I think just, yeah, <laughs> digging into all that. What was it, Minority Report? Was that the name of the movie that had all the AR, VR kind of stuff, yeah. like way ahead of its time? So listeners and kids in the audience, <laughs> if you want to see like all the stuff that's happening now, well before it was a thing, it was like 2001, go check out Minority yeah. Report. Interesting, interesting to see that. We, this show is not sponsored by Minority or, <laughs> or Coffee. <laughs> but Jenny, what are you most obsessed with right now? Oh, man. I mean, I can't possibly not answer this question with coffee in some way. I feel like I'd be doing an injustice <laughs> to the business that I own. Um, but, I mean, in reality, it has been a huge obsession for me over the last, I would say, almost a year now. We opened the business in January of uh, 2018, so... The idea of coffee and what it is and how it's made and how it comes to be uh, has been a huge obsession of mine over the last year. I wasn't actually very into coffee before we opened the business. It was my husband who kind of kick-started the love for me. Um, so I have to say that. And I guess tying right into coffee would be kombucha, which is my other obsession right now, um, which we also have at Indie Coffee Roasters. <laughs> so you can come get a glass. <laughs> shameless plug um so I, I would say that that falls right in line there but i mean yeah what these guys have said is, were also great answers i mean my family my one-year-old and my husband are my other obsession um just learning how to be a parent and how to take care of a tiny little human who is the cutest human i've ever seen um is kind of is kind of in my other obsession and like i mentioned before the children's book thing is kind of where my my next uh i think you know, project that I'm going to do on my own is is kind of heading towards is how do I incorporate my love of design and art with my love of, for my family? So this is a bonus question for everyone, I guess. Um, what's your go-to coffee consumption method? Is it nitro, cold brew, or pour over espresso, drip, curry, hopefully not? <laughs> like, what's what's your go-to? So I don't even know if I should say this, but I actually don't drink coffee. <laughs> I'm, 
I feel like, I know, I just said that and we're recording this, but I feel like I have to be honest, um, and I actually don't drink coffee, so my go-to is kombucha, which we can, we also supply, so that also is, fair. that is my go-to, but I would love to hear what these guys and you, Josh, like it's to, uh, like to drink. Love it. Nate? <laughs> oh, I sound like, I'm such a coffee snob. Uh, yeah, I've got, I mean, I'll admit, I saved all my, like, Bed Bath & Beyond coupons and waited for it to go on sale, so I have this, like, swanky, ridiculous espresso machine, because it's got to be ground, I mean, you know what I mean? And then uh, my new obsession right now is in the afternoon, because I drink coffee. I could literally drink it all day long, but um, uh, what do you call it? I don't know, it's like where you take two shots of espresso, which is, <laughs> I don't need, but anyway, and you just put some heavy whipping, like, cr well, not heavy whipping cream, but whipped cream in there. Made from anyway, but uh, oh lord, it's delicious. <laughs> yes, love it. I'm just totally not like that. I mean, I just like m my coffee black, and uh, and you know, the other night I was like, um, I had a cup of coffee. I'm like, man, this is good coffee. And the lady was like, yeah, just it's the Kroger brand, you know. And I'm like, yeah, it's like, I'm like this is really good. It's the best coffee I've had in a while. So I, um, man, I'm so pretty, I'm pretty simple. Bombshells in this. I know. <laughs> I'm pretty simple. It's just hot, I would say. It's okay. He makes his way into indie coffee roasters. So. <laughs> so I know everybody's dying to know, but Americano with heavy cream. Mm, there you go. Yes, that's, that's, mm, yes, thank you. Um, so audience, this is almost the time where you start asking these genius questions, and we're going to turn on the room mic so we can record the audio here in a second. But before we wrap up um, and go into the audience questions, um, I want to give everybody a chance just to share with you. I know we've got some some URLs and handles and whatnot on the screen for those of you who are in the room, but uh, for our listeners uh, on the podcast, I want to make sure and tell them where to find you on the interwebs. So, Andy, where where can folks track you down? Um, the simplest way is just kellerinteractive.com, and you can uh, my Twitter, all that stuff is on there, but you'll find me at AD as in David Keller um, on Twitter, Instagram, all that. So, and you can email me from my website as well. Excellent. Nate, where are you on the interwebs? The interwebs. Um, I am a big Instagram person, so I mean, uh, Instagram's probably the biggest one. And then, of course, YouTube. All my stuff uh, that we've produced thus far is on there. Now, coming up, please, if you happen to see, I mean, we are trying right now. Um, it'll be on Discovery Channel in the UK, but then hopefully Netflix here. So if it comes on, you've got to watch it and tell your friends about it. So anyway, yeah, outside of that, um, yeah, just Outrageous with Nate or Outrageous Nate or, yeah, or just email. Yeah. yeah, well, definitely remind me when it comes on, and then we'll share that with the podcast listeners as well. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Jenny Todd, where are you online? Yeah, so um, easiest for me is uh, JennyTodd.com. Todd is with one D, not two. So Jenny, T-O-D.com. Um, hi at JennyTodd.com is my email. Feel free to uh, shoot me an email at any time. And then, yeah, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Jenny M. Todd is the best place. And then you can also visit IndieCoffeeRoasters.com. It's I-N-D-I-E, CoffeeRoasters.com. And we've got all of the social medias there as well. Excellent. And of course, we will list all of that on the show notes at obsessedshow.com, where you can also sign up for email. Uh, one tiny plug for myself, if you head over to youtube.com slash Josh Miles, I'm doing some, some fun experiments there. Good place to check that out. And please and thank you. So let's go out to the audience now and get some audience questions. Uh, we'll turn on those, those room mics, so hopefully we can hear you on the recording, and uh, if you guys have questions for a specific panelist, or maybe for the group, who would like to go first? Yeah, down in front. Um, have there been any points in your careers where you've had this, like, creative block where, you know, nothing is just coming to you, and if you've had those creative blocks, how have you overcome those, you know, moments in your career? So just in case, the question was about creative block and, and how we've overcome those. So anybody want to tackle that first? I will. Um, yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, absolutely. I think that I experience them often, maybe not like 
a career creative block, but just in general, I mean, creative block is, I think, normal for any creative person. I feel like we have this pressure to always be on and always be creative, and that can be a little bit uh, stressful, a little bit daunting sometimes. I think the thing I've found for me is that when I feel like I can't come up with anything is I honestly just step away from the project and I get outside of my computer. So if I'm working solely on my computer, I get outside, I go in nature somewhere, I go to the IMA or I have fun with my family for the afternoon or I do something because I know that when I come back, I'm going to be more productive than sitting there trying to come up with something. So I think it's just getting outside of the routine of your day and experiencing something new. I think a lot of times that brings inspiration for me. Yeah, I've absolutely had a similar, um, uh, I guess, result. I think um, I, there are, to add to that, I think I have, um, several, I guess, designers that I look up to that are like men- mentors or whatever, like Jenny or others that I, I would say, um, um, that I would get stuck with something and, and, and pass it over to them and just say, where, you know, where would you go with this or what, you know, just help me out here. Any, any insight? What do you think? Is it colors? Is it what, you know, and, um, to get their feedback. And sometimes that's enough just to spark, you know, the next route that you take. But just like Jenny said, that is the number one thing for me is that stepping away is the biggest thing, whether you're doing design or development work. I mean, I've been, I've spent hours on a problem in on the development side even and going, I just cannot figure out why this isn't going and then take a break from it, maybe come back to it the next morning. And all of a sudden it's like, there it is. It's, it was missing, you know, this character or whatever. And, um, and I wasted all that time. So yeah, stepping away is really, is one of the biggest things you could do. Yeah, you're, you're not, a, <laughs> at least feel that much. I think everybody goes through. I was thinking of Jackson Pollock who would go through it all the time. But um, yeah, I do the same thing. Walk away, I go hike, I go walk, I run. I went swimming yesterday, like create a block. And I also have like, um, the nice thing about the day and age we live in is, I mean, data, right? I mean, I have insane amounts of data. So I know when someone hates something and I can usually figure out what they do like. And so I can take that data and it helps me inform like, okay, well, if I'm stuck on this animation and the way I'm doing it, um, I'll just get, what did they say? You know, or I also have a group of people who are, have no create, I'm not creative, I'm no creativity, but they are not in an art background. Um, and I actually have, a, and, and I have students groups, whatever, kind of like a, a panel essentially that I'll send my stuff out to and be like, here's where I'm at, like fearless feedback. And sometimes it's good, but I think that's the hardest part as a designer, right? You work hours on something um, Dale Chihuly, which you saw up there, we animated him. It was the second episode, and I animated him as a stick puppet at the time is what we were doing. And I sent it because his people were like, yeah, we love it. And they didn't show it to Chihuly, who, I'm sorry, I should say he's kind of an old butthead. But point being is he watched it and was like, I hate it. I got a call from his lawyer. So I had to start from scratch after like animating for freaking weeks because of that. So, I mean, I think it's just being, I've got to, Reimagine. I mean, you can't be like scared for the feedback, but I think putting yourself out there for that is like, man, it's it can be priceless feedback, though. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, so for each of you, what would you say your biggest motivation is to continue what you're doing? Yeah. What's your perhaps for the freelance graphic design? I think you're the only freelance, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you two? We all freelance. Mm-hmm. What would you say the biggest motivation? I'm kind of a people pleaser, um, so I think I, I really like to um, exceed somebody's expectations or or at least meet them. But um, you know, it's fun. It's a sometimes it's a game. I think it's like you 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 get somebody and trust you with their project or um, or a problem that they're having with their website or whatever, and um, to say to take that and to come up with solutions and and. Um, I mean, I think that's that's kind of a fun fun thing for them to say. Oh yeah, this this does it. Or to look at analytics maybe a year later and go, yeah, that really improved your click through rate. Or that you know, just changing the the color of that button made it more appealing to somebody. So whatever it is, but I th- I think like stuff like that, you know, keeps me going. I guess, and um, I think overall though, it's just it's fun. It's a it's a fun industry. It's you know, you can be creative. I don't know. Things like that, I guess. Yeah, sure. Me? All right. Um, 
I mean, I, I think my biggest motivation is my family. So I, I, uh, have the honor and the privilege of being able to do this. I feel every day super lucky that I get to do something that I enjoy so much for a career. Um, and I think amongst all of the things that are, you know, I want to be better and I want to do great work and I want to make an impact. I think the biggest thing for me is knowing that I'm taking care of my family. I'm helping take care of my family. And so I'm constantly working hard in order to provide for them. Um, so I, I, that's what I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think it's still the, I always think of a scale, the positives still outweigh the, the sacrifices as we kind of talked at the beginning, right? Like insurance. Um, but anyway, but yeah, I think it's, it's, I mean, I love creative problem solving and I love telling a story. So I own a production company at the end of the day. And so, I mean, literally, I may be working on an, an episode, but then, and I mean, I'm doing freelance. It doesn't know. I mean, I, I literally made a commercial for a hot tub company, which was hilarious. But at the end of the day, it was super fun. I mean, I love sitting down with people. It's a different kind of project, and I love change, and I love that it keeps things different. I think that's for, for me showing up teaching every day. No offense to teachers. I love you. But uh, I just couldn't do it anymore because I couldn't differentiate year three from eight. And so I just wanted something that I knew, oh, we're at hot tubs today, you know, like in telling, digging through that creative story. Uh, but then it could be something else. So I think... Again, it's, it's a balance and there's sacrifice, but I think at the end of the day, I love it. And um, it does, it kind of keeps the fuel in the fire and it's just fun, you never know. I never know what's gonna, I don't even know what's gonna happen next week. So it's like, woo, uh, yeah. Yeah, even for, for me personally, like my, my day job is CMO is like strategy and which means a lot of phone calls and meetings and <laughs> email and uh, spreadsheets and you know, things that aren't necessarily getting into the making of stuff. And a lot of the um, the freelance work that I've been doing lately has been video related. So I'm just pushing myself to learn new technologies and new stuff, and learning how to fight with Adobe Premiere and all the I'll strangle with. <laughs> That's right. But like learning how to use a drone and learning how to use a DSLR and all all these kind of technologies is it's just fun for me to like keep me interested and keep me like in some variety and just as fulfilling to find. Um, things that are outside of the normal day to day. Maybe uh, one more question from the audience. Yeah, thanks. Uh, how do you mentally prepare yourselves for a big project? Okay, so the question was just in case we didn't get that on the audio: was how do you prepare yourselves mentally before a big project? Anybody want to jump in there? I think the biggest the biggest thing for me is honestly just. Um, understanding kind of what are the goals, what are we working to accomplish, who's the audience, um, and ultimately what problem are we trying to solve. So it's a lot of kind of setting myself up with the strategy of something, even though we work in a creative field where a lot of what we do, at least for me, is visual, there's so much behind it and there's such, there needs, there has to be a purpose behind what we're doing for me in order for me to really feel like I'm being successful. And so understanding all of that information first, and then I think the next place I immediately go is word listing and sketching and inspiration finding and a lot of the uh, setup before I even start working on what is this gonna be or what's it gonna look like, is just really feeling like I am kind of grounded in what we're doing and why, and uh, I've looked for it and found inspiration to get me there. That's a tough question. I would say as well, and one thing I, I know we don't have time for, but I'd love to know too, is like preparing yourself for when you, you massively fail. I think how you handle that as a freelance is hard. Um, I've done that many times. So if you want to stick out of <laughs> or when I spend That's all another interview. a lot of figures of money and epically bomb, I mean, it's an education is what I always tell myself. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think like I have a big project. You just made me like I'm starting to sweat. Um, I literally have promised uh, my aid, the agent I have for our show now that I will produce 12, 30, 25 minute episodes and literally they range from India, Cuba. I mean, it's just, it's daunting to me. Um, and I'm like overwhelmed by it, but I also remind myself like, I'll wake up and I'm like, um, but you know, you can do it. I mean, I think that's what you tell yourself is like we were just saying, there are, there are people that can host a show a heck of a lot better than I can, but they're, maybe they're not doing it. And there's people probably in your class who are maybe a better designer than you are, but they're not here. So 
the point is, you are you. And I think that's what you got to remember is like, you are you and that's all you need. And the other is, um, I'm only as awesome as the people that I surround myself with. So I've spent the past three weeks-ish meeting with like, I mean, other videographers, designers, uh, you know what I mean? Like, I, I know I can only be as great as the people, the feedback, and I surround. I mean, it's, it is not a one-man show at all. So, yeah, I think it's just realizing your limitations, but also realizing you can do it. I mean, just figure it out. MacGyver it, um, you know? Yeah, I, and I don't know if I have anything significant to add other than, I mean, it's, it's um, sometimes it's just, just doing it, and there's there's times when I um, I'm not ready for a project or I'm not ready to to jump into something mentally, but it's like you just gotta. I just have to tell myself just do it, just get started and get going. And um, a lot of times it sort of just falls into place after maybe even a couple of iterations. But um, but I wouldn't have even gotten there if I hadn't even just gotten started and just gotten past that mental block of just going. So. Well, guys, it's been a pleasure having uh, Jenny Todd, Nate Heck, and Andy Keller all here today for this live taping of Obsessed with Design at IUPUI for the Computer Graphics Technology Group. Guys, thanks for being here, and thank you for being obsessed with design. Let's give them a round of applause. Thanks. Okay, kids, that's episode number 108 in the books. You can get all of today's show notes at our website, obsessedshow.com. While you're there, make sure and give us your email address so we can update you on all the things that are happening in my various podcasts and media world. Also, we've added links to the website on all the places you can find the show, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio, or Spotify. All the links are there. So make sure and subscribe to Obsessed Show from the ObsessedShow.com website. Obsessed with Design is a product of the Design Obsessed team at Miles Herndon, a branding agency in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.